Did you all go through my answers? Okay. So I guess it's my job to quiz all of you and make sure you understand this well. Okay, so let me start with this image before I take you through any of meiosis. Okay, now you see two chromosomes here, similar size and shape. What do we call them? Okay, now how many pairs of these do all of you have in yourselves? Yeah, you have 23 pairs of two, right? Very good. Now, very important question. This is one homologous pair. Pick a number from 1 to 23. Anything. Four. Four. So this is chromosome pair four. Right, you have two chromosomes of chromosome pair four. Now, how many of those chromosomes came from mum? How many came from dad? Very good, right? So, a very important principle all of you need to understand is that whenever we talk about homologous chromosomes, one entire chromosome came from parent one, the other entire chromosome came from parent two. Now, can I tell me about this shape right now in your cells? Do your chromosomes have this shape? Question to all of you, and even the online students, can you raise your hand now? Your chromosomes look like this in your cell. Okay, so no one's raised their hand. Ethan, why? All right. Jessica, any ideas? Do your chromosomes look like this? No. And yeah. why is that? No. I'm not sure. Does anyone have an answer? He's, he's on to something, right? Right now, all of your chromosomes look like this. I, I call it spaghetti soup. That's what your nucleus looks like right now. And to understand that, you need to know what makes up a chromosome. So you all see these rods, right? That's one rod. That is another rod. What makes up these rods? Two things I want to hear, two words. What is a rod made out of? Give it a go. Idea. One word starts with D, it's three letters, you should know it. DNA, right? That's about 40% of this rod. What is the other 60%? Yeah. Very good, right? So remember I told you all, a chromosome is quite literally, imagine that you've got a ball of histone protein. And imagine, kind of like a silk thread, you wrap that around this ball, just like this. Does everyone see what I'm doing here? Do you see how we turn a string into a linear structure that way? Right? That is what a chromosome is. You can't forget that. When I say, what are the two parts of a chromosome? I want to hear histones and DNA. And the proportion is mainly histones. Question? Histones are a type of structural protein. That's all you need to know. If I had to zoom in and show you what they look like, you see these clusters? Now, all of you are getting your notes printed for you, so you get all of this, but for now, does everyone see the little ball-like structures that are making up the histones, right? When you wrap the string around, that's what a chromosome is. Now, can you read a book if the book's closed? No chance. It's the same principle with DNA. For your enzymes to read DNA and to make things out of it, they need to read the letters. So what needs to happen is you need to unwind the string from the protein. And that is why I say, right now in your nucleus, it looks like a spaghetti ball, right? All the DNA has been unwound from the histone and it's been read by enzymes to make proteins. Now, the second most important principle is with these rod-like structures. Your chromosomes only look like this at one point in time. It's in meiosis and mitosis, okay? There is no other time your chromosomes look like this. The reason that I tell you this is because, do you see the circle that I've made around one rod? That is a chromosome. What you see on the other side here, this structure here, is its twin sister, or replicated copy. Now you all learned something happens in the first part of meiosis and mitosis. What was that? What happens there? DNA replication. Yes. Now this is the effect of DNA replication. If I was to replicate you, I'd get a copy of you. If I was to replicate you, twin copy. What you're seeing here is a twin copy of chromosome attached to the original one. It's only an X structure. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to give you all an exam tip now. There's only one time point you will see this X shape very clearly. If you see this X shape, we're in progress. And I'll talk about what that means. If you've forgotten all the stages, don't worry. But now I just want you to write that down. 
that is the time in which you will start to see this X structure for a primary cell. Okay, very good. Now, can anyone tell me what is a central button? You see these little buttons here, and I'll get Keir for now. I want you to tell me what this button structure is. Lookman, what's the button structure? Uh, Centre me. Very good. Now, what is a centre me? Very good, right? So, for those who didn't hear what she mentioned, I guess the key principle here is a centromere is the only thing that is keeping those two sister chromatids attached to one another. Okay? The second you break that centromere, it's kind of like ripping a button. The shirt will move apart. Does that make sense? Same principle with these chromosomes. Now, these two chromosomes here, chromosome 1 and chromosome 2, I want you to put your hands up, and the same for online students. Put your hands up if you think they're exact copies of one another. Okay, we're slowly getting some momentum here. All of you should be putting your hands up. They're exact copies. When DNA replicates, it copies every single base letter for letter. So those two adjacent chromosomes are exact copies. Does that make sense? What about this whole set of chromosomes? The exact copy? Why are you nodding your head? Because that's, I mean, so they're paired off in multi-spheres based on size and shape, but they're also going to compare different genetic information and information. So. Okay. Did you all learn about mitosis? Yeah? Okay. Now, I guess the key principle here is that chromosome came from a different parent. So, of course, it's not the same as the other chromosome. That's a simple logic. Okay? Now, I guess the last thing I want to talk about here is what these letters represent. You see T's, you see S's, you see R's. My first question to you is, what does a T, what does an S, what does an R represent? The letters, I'm not talking about uppercase, lowercase. What does each letter represent? Okay. What's a gene? Very good, right? So I hope everyone heard that. Section of DNA that codes for a protein. So every line that I've drawn represents a gene. Does that make sense? So the letter T, the letter S, the letter R refer to three different genes. Now again, when I call you, make sure you say your name as well, because I'm still memorizing all of you here. Okay? So I'll ask you, pick a random trait that humans have. Yeah. Uh -huh. And eyes. Okay. So let's say T's eye color. Jessica, I want you to pick another trait for S. Any trait. Pick something. And Georgina, pick something for R. Hair. Not brown hair. Hair. Remember, that's the trait. Pick another trait for me. Skin. Okay, sure. Those are genes. Does everyone agree? Different traits coded for by a protein. Now, the capital and lowercase refer to alloys. Now, let's say you're sitting your HC exam. And the question is define an alloy. I know what you I know you all know what it is, but writing it down on exam paper is a completely different game. So Abhishek, what's an alloy? It is a characteristic or shape. You define a gene, there must be a difference. Are there different um, words? It looks to be recessive with logic. Okay. So he's getting somewhere, but I want the key point. Good. So she's got the first part down. It's a variation of a gene. That is what an alley is. I'm looking for one other part. The image is going to give the clue away. Where are all the T's? Where are all the S's? Where are all the R's? What do we call that in biology? You're at the same location. They don't know that. It starts with L. Sounds like location. Yes, that's exactly what I want to hear. So what I've shown you each horizontal line represents a locus. So what an allele is, is that it's a variation of a gene that lies at the exact same location or locus. Does that make sense to everyone? I want you to underline the second part. That's what separates a band five and six good. Same location is very important. Good. Now just remember you have 23 pairs of this. The genes on each chromosome are completely different. So, Tanya, you said chromosome pair four. 
right? Pick another number. 1 to 23. Chromosome pair 10. That's going to have completely different genes. You're not going to find eye color, hair color, and skin color on chromosome pair 10. There'll be other traits. It could be, for example, eyebrow thickness, right? Literally any trait you can think of. Okay? But point being, different genes usually lie on different chromosomes. Does that make sense? Very good. Now, you learned about mitosis. What's the purpose of mitosis? Ashfia? Very good. Those are the three words I'm looking for, right? Growth, because you were once a zygote, you were one cell. Look at you now, your meat is tall, right? So growth is very important. Maintenance, who's, been, who's, who's had a paper cut before? Surely all of you, right? If you've studied enough, you've got a paper cut. Now, what happens in a paper cut is the skin cells undergo mitosis and they cover up the wound, right? That's what's happening automatically. You don't have to think about that, right? So that's the repair phase of things, okay? And maintenance, well, I know we, we all are very young, youthful, but you're all going to age and get old, right? Now, what does it mean to get old at the skin level? When you start getting wrinkles, the forehead lines, what does that mean to happen at the level of your skin with mitosis? Yeah, it slows down. You have less cells. Decreased cellularity is one of the hallmarks of aging. You have less cells because there's less mitosis. Okay? And the reason we die, everyone, because a cell can only undergo mitosis a fixed number of times. So by the time you're 70, 80, you have cells that stop dividing. They're just waiting to die slowly. And when all those cells start to degenerate, that's what death is, right? Very good. So the last part is maintenance. Now, what are the three phases of mitosis? Well, not really three phases. What are the different phases? There's more than three. Someone said interphase. That's one of them. So who can tell me all the phases? How, do you, how did you remember that? I just remember it maps. Right, it's my little... That a mnemonic or acronym to remember things. Now with bio, you want to have weird, wacky mnemonics. Because one of the hard parts of bio for students is there's a lot to know, right? The way you know everything in the fine-tuned details is through acronyms, through stories, through weird, wacky mnemonics. This is the simplest type of mnemonic. It's an acronym. I want you to remember this. Mnemonics are not acronyms, okay? Mnemonics are bigger than that. I'll teach you that as we go, okay? But for now, it maps are the different phases of mitosis. So you know why it happens. Now we're going to look at the different phases. How often is mitosis happening in your body cells? Yes. So one cell, how often does it divide? Pick a, pick a number. 48 hours, typically. Okay. So what that means is if you have billions of cells, every single second a cell is divided. Okay. Why are these phases automatically? Now, the reason I brought this up was, you might have all seen this. Has anyone seen this before, right? Does anyone understand it? What this is showing you is that the cell spends majority of its life in the first stage of mitosis. What was that first stage? Majority of a cell's life is an interface. So what does that tell you? The hardest job is done at interface. What job is that? I wish I mentioned it. Do you remember? Very good. DNA replicates. So DNA replicates. Now you'll see there are different subphases in interphase. Does everyone see that? There's a G1, there is an S, and there is a G2. Now it's actually very logical to understand this, right? I want you to remember this. S stands for synthesis. The DNA is replicating in S phase. Okay? So now you know it's specifically the S phase of interphase in which DNA will die. Okay? How long is DNA? I've told you all this. If I was to get your cell, get the DNA, put it vertically from the ground, from one of your cells, how tall would it be? Two meters, right? 1.8 to 2, depending on what chromosome we're looking at. So if I got you to copy two meters of a book, right? Two meter transcript. How likely would you be to get everything right the first go? Very unlikely. So what do you think happens at G2? 
simple, right? The body's very logical. When you start memorizing bio, you start doing that. When you start understanding bio, it makes a lot more sense. G2 is where you error check the two meters of DNA that you created. So just remember G2 is a double check, okay? Good. Now G1 is where everything other than the DNA got duplicated. So what do we call the organs of a cell? You learned this in year 11. I think it was an entire module, right? Module one, you learned about all the different organelles, what they do. So in G1, it's where everything else, all the organelles, divided. Now, from an exam point of view, all you need to know is the cell spends most of its time in interface and DNA replicates in that space. That, that's the most important thing. Does that make sense? Now, the little section here represents the rest of mitosis. So, we ask partial. What are the remaining stages of mitosis that we have? We've done interphase. What else is remaining? Okay, I'll ask. Um, uh, then it would be perphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Very good. What's the final step, Marshall? There's one uh, more. Cytokinesis. Yes, very good. Cytokinesis. The final step is cytokinesis. Now, what does that word mean? Yeah, it's the physical splitting of cells. So you need to remember if not C. Okay? Good. Now, did you all go through this last lesson? Okay, so I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to test you. So I'm just going to go across the room, and I'm going to ask you what happens in the phases. Okay? Because there's a lot of things going on. You need to know the key important steps. Otherwise, it's just a mess of information in your head. So we spoke about interface. One thing I wanted you to remember was... That's it, right? Very good. What about prophase? What happens in prophase? Alicia? Okay. Membranes start to disappear. Anything else? Yeah, I want you to remember this. Prophase is where all the weird half half stuff happens. Nothing really happens in prophase except one important thing. And I told you to write this in the book. I said we'll come back to it. What did I get you to write? Yes, I want you to remember that. If you see the X shape, you know the cell has finished interphase and it's in prophase. Okay? Because in interphase, what happens is one bowl of spaghetti becomes two. That's what happens. It's not condensed yet. So prophase is when everything will condense. Okay? Now, the other features of, I guess this is my little diagram. This is how you'll understand it best. Okay? Now, again, I told you, it really looks like spaghetti. I've drawn it like little lines, these chromosomes. For you to understand. Okay? How many homologous pairs do we have here for this cell? Good. So, what's the diploid number? That's for you, Muscle, for this cell. 2n is a diploid number, but what's the number? 2n equals 4. That's what you're seeing here. Okay? So, this is some creature from another species that has four chromosomes. Make sense? How many chromosomes would the gametes have, Tyler? Half of them. Remember, gametes have half the genetic information of a diploid cell because they're haploid. Haploid means half. Okay? Very good. Now, coming to this, you see the X shape. So, straight away, what phase are we in? Oh, very good. Now, do you all see what else is happening here? The nuclear membrane is starting to break down. Why is that? You have to think about what's going to happen next. What, what happens in metaphase? Yeah, right? I remember one thing for metaphase. Metaphase equals N for middle liner. It lines up along the middle of the entire cell. So it needs to get out of the nucleus. It's very tiny, the nucleus, right? So that's why I remember the nuclear membrane has started to degenerate. Now, something needs to line everything up in the middle. What is that something? So they must form by prophase. Does that make sense? So those are the two big things that happen in prophase. Membrane starts to disappear. Spindle fibers start to form. That's it. Make your life easy. Don't need to memorize anything else. Okay? Now, what's happening in metaphase? Getting middle line up of chromosomes. It's that simple. 
That's all you need to remember. Okay. What about Anna Face? What happens with Anna Face? Yeah? The uh, upper one, the schedule starts to pull away the the What did the spindle fibers attach to, bro? Very good. So what I said, essentially is the only thing holding those two chromatids together. So when you break apart the centromere, what happens to the chromatids? They spin flat around, right? And now since the spindle fibers are pulling it to either end, they'll move to opposite ends. Does that logically make sense? Okay. Now think about this in terms of the genes, right? What did we say? On a chromosome, we have two homologous chromosomes, right, within a pair. And within one homologous pair, one chromosome comes from parent one, the other chromosome comes from parent two. Now, what about genes? Who wants to define a gene for me again? Georgina. Very good. And uh, name and what is it, Alan? Alan, give it a go. So it's a variation of the gene. But Kiara, why don't I draw the horizontal lines? Do alleles lie on the same location or different location to one another? Same, exactly. So if you imagine this is a trait, this is let's say hair color, right? So this is hair. The alleles would lie on that locus. All the variations of hair color need to lie on that locus, right? So if, if we had the brown hair, allele here, what allele would we have here? Good, why is that? It's the exact same copy, does everyone agree? This is a twin sister chromatid. But if I asked you all, what allele lies here, what would you say? Could be anything, it's from another parent, right? Different chromosome come from a different parent. Let's say that was blue. So what allele must lie here? Easy, does that make sense? Now, why am I drawing lowercase and uppercase? From the inner recessive, we'll come back to that. I just wanted you to generally know that some traits will mask the other when they occur together. So if you've got a blue eye allele from Dad and a brown, I think I picked hair color, but I'm talking about eye color here. So bear with me. If you inherit a blue eye aloe from a parent and a brown eye aloe from the other parent, one of them is going to mask the other, and you'll only express one, right? That's the principle behind dominance. We'll come back to that. Very good. Now, let me ask Cushy. Cushy, what happens in the process of anaphase here? This is very important because when I start talking about meiosis, things are going to get more complicated. Um, in anaphase, the sister chromatids are pulled apart. Very good. Okay. Good. They move to opposite ends of the cell. Now, this is where you start seeing this, this curvature in the cell. Does everyone see that? What do we call this? What a funny name. Yeah, it's cell cleavage. That's what you call it. Okay, very good. And what will eventually happen is we go into telophase now. What do you see is what do you see is happening in telophase? Now I want someone to give me a way to think about this, not just blurt out content. How do I think about if I forget my exam, I'm sitting there to see, I just forgot what happened in telophase. How am I gonna remember? Uh, yeah, you see some pinching. That's more cytokinesis, but we're, we're getting there. Okay, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds. Telophase versus prophase. What do you notice as a relationship between them? So the nuclear membrane started to break down in prophase. What's happening in telophase? Reforming. The spindle fibers were formed in prophase. What's happening in telophase? Are they there? So what's the relationship of prophase and telophase? There you go. Do you remember that? You make your life easier, right? So you know what happened in prophase, you know what happened in telophase. The exact opposite. Does that make sense to everyone? Good. And finally, we have cytokinesis. Now what Varun mentioned is quite important. There are proteins at the center here. Right, these contractile proteins. And the way they work is they will contract and thus break the two ends of the cell apart. 
Okay. Now you will never ever be asked to explain the mechanism of cytokinesis. You never need to actually write in human proteins. All you need to know is cytokinesis is a physical splitting into two. Does that make sense? Very good. Now, final question, which is very logical. These daughter cells, will they be the exact same as a parent cell? Exact same to the T. Think about this. So it's an important question. I want to see who is memorizing and who is understanding. Logic. I mean, exact same. So put your hand if you think the nucleus is the exact same. And I want the online students as well. Put your hand up if you think the nucleus is the exact same for the daughter cell and the parent cell. So I mean the chromosomes. Yeah, I agree, right? They're exact copies of that parent cell. So they must be identical. But what about size? Imagine you, went my, imagine you underwent mitosis, right? Your ends stretched apart. You got chopped in the middle. Would I have two identically... Would you look like the original version? Yeah, look like a horror show, right? So point being, these daughter cells are much smaller than the parent cell. Does that make sense? Now, why is that? Apart from the size thing, why do you think cells want to stay small? Because this could be an exam question. Yes, very good, right? When a cell gets too big, its surface area relative to its volume is not as big. What I mean by that is when the cell gets larger, its volume goes up, but the surface of that cell does not increase at the same rate. Now, imagine a very tiny baby versus a, the biggest, most obese person in the world. Who would make more waste? Bigger person, right? So what happens is a cell gets bigger is that it makes more waste and it needs more nutrients. But can it get those nutrients and can it remove the waste at a fast enough rate? So what happens is as the cell gets bigger, waste starts to increase, right? And if a cell does not split into two in time, it will die because there'll be a buildup of waste that it cannot remove in time. And it will require nutrients that it cannot get in time. So the only thing I want you to write now is mitosis ensures high surface area to volume ratio of cells. That's another lateral thinking point that you need to remember. Okay? Good. Any questions at all? Online students, in center students, anyone? Any questions at all about mitosis? Now, this is the last thing I want you to remember. The student that asks a ton of questions is typically the student that's more curious and the student that will do better in the HSC. The student that, you know, wants to make sure that they show up, they're smart by not asking anything, probably the dumbest thing you can do. Because all your questions will be brought up in the exam and you won't know the answer. Okay? So oh, any question you have, ask now. Lookman? Um, yeah, so just could you reiterate what you said before? The, what was the reason why it has to um, go small again? Yeah, the so I guess if you, you can all quick match this as well. You can find the surface area to volume ratio of a cube that's one by one centimeter and the surface area to volume ratio of a cube that's 10 by 10 centimeters, right? You'll notice that the larger cube has a much smaller surface area to volume ratio. It, what this means is as a cube gets larger, volume increases. We all understand that, right? It's just length cubed, okay? Volume dictates how much or the amount of waste that you produce and the amount of nutrients you get. That's what volume dictates, right? Larger the person, more nutrients they need to maintain the same weight, okay? Surface area is kind of like the size of your mouth. That's the surface, right? It dictates how fast you can get food in there and how fast you can get rid of waste. Okay, that's what surface area dictates, right? So, as we get larger, relative to the volume, the surface area decreases. Relative to the volume, right? So, what that means is as you get larger and larger, the aperture, the mouth part of the cell, gets smaller and smaller. So, can it take in nutrients as fast? No. Can it? regurgitate waste as fast. So it builds up, right? You pretty much starve from the inside and your waste builds up and the cell will eventually die. The surface area dictates the rate of nutrient intake and waste outtake. As the cell gets larger, 
it requires more, but it can't get it in or it can't remove the waste out fast enough. So that's why it will eventually die. Does that make sense, Luke? Yep, thank you. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Think about this. When did it happen? It happened in G1. What was G1? Interface. So it happens all in interface. Yeah, it has double the organelles in interface, right? So it's holding double the organelles. Only when it splits will it return to the correct number of organelles. Okay? But you have to realize some organelles, it's good to have more. Think about your muscle cells. Would it need more or less mitochondria? Yeah, so many of your cells have many copies of one organelle. So it doesn't really matter how much you have in total. That's why you don't learn about where the organelles are. Not too familiar. Nucleus is the most important thing. Okay? Good. Now, this is what your textbooks look like. See how much information there is. But you've kind of consolidated it all into the key points. That's what biology is. Okay? Don't use textbooks to learn too much. You need to get the key principle and do tons of questions. That is how you do well. Okay? Who's doing textbook questions or who's getting school worksheets that they're just doing at school? That's probably the worst way to learn, right? Because there's worksheets with the question, they're all band one, two questions. What is a cell? What is an organelle? That kind of stuff. The HFC, they're going to give you a huge disease that you've never heard of and ask you to logically derive the rate of mitosis based on a graph. What, right? So this is why you need to do exam questions from the get-go, okay? You will have access to, you will have access to the online versions of the books, right? So the questions are, should be at the end, and it's throughout the booklet. You have bunches of homework questions to test yourself, okay? Good. Now we're going to go to meiosis, and the reason I'm teaching you this over again is because I have very specific things I want you to know, and you have to not to do well in your exams, and more importantly, to understand this entire process. Now, meiosis is much more important in terms of an exam setting. They're going to ask you a ton of questions about meiosis. I can bet you, your 2022 HSE, there will be a huge question about meiosis. So this is where I want you to pay 100% attention, okay? What's meiosis for? We said mitosis is for growth, repair, maintenance. What does meiosis occur for? Okay, great gametes, very good. And where does that happen? Very good. So reproductive organs. What do we call those? Okay. Very good. Maybe I'll go a little bit higher to our my our most of the section is after this, but it's all right. I'm going to draw it all for you. So no issues either way. Okay, so it occurs solely for the production of gametes. Why is that important? Well, um, Who remembers the syllabus? There was a there's a word or a phrase you need to add. Does everyone hear what you said? That's what I want to hear. Okay? Meiosis is integral to the continuity of a species. This is how you have to think about this. For a species to continue, what do we need? I've taught this to you already, so this is more of a test. What do you need for a species to continue? It's an important question because there used to be six different species of human. Five of them are gone. Right? So only Homo sapiens now. Yeah, so we need to make very good. So this is an organism. Number one, what she's mentioned is it needs to be able to reproduce to produce fertile offspring. Very good. What else does it need? So this organism right now is a zygote. Can it reproduce? Can a zygote replicate and make another human? No. So what does it need to do? Yes, it needs to survive to reproductive age. Now, Jessica, what cell replication process do organisms use to survive to a reproductive age? Now, I want the rest of you to think about this because I'm going to ask you soon. Jessica, what's your answer? Okay, it's all right, Lookman? Um, uh, mitosis. Very good. So what I want to hear is we need mitosis to survive to a reproductive, so to, to reproductive maturity, and then we need meiosis. Do we need meiosis to reproduce? Like with the actual re reproduction process? 
No. Yeah. We needed to make the gametes that through reproduction will combine. Does that make sense? So reproduction is happening all the time in males. It happened in utero for females. The process of reproduction is just combining the two. That's what the goal of population of reproduction for, for a multicellular organism is. Okay, very good. So we need meiosis to produce the gametes. Now, what's the difference between males and females in terms of gamete production? Yes. Very good, right? So females are in utero, they have the most ova that they will ever have in their life. Even by birth, some of the ova start to degenerate. And the ova only start to get released once the female organism reaches reproductive maturity. Okay? Now, what hormone triggers that? Could be an exam question. What is the hormone that is most integral to initiate ovulation? So, FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, is it? Go higher. Because the estrogen was released because the FSH acted on the ovary. What caused the FSH to be released? GNRH is the answer. Cool. Sorry. Okay, good. So the answer would, would have been GNRH. That's what an exam question would be like for you ages. Right? So that's the level of lateral thinking you have to do. Okay, good. All right, we'll come to meiosis now. So I'll actually just go all the way to the meiosis section of our notes. So we understand this. Um, uh, excuse me, sir? Yeah. Sorry, um, could you go back to that diagram? Did you, I just wanted to uh, screenshot it. Sure. Thank you. Okay, now when we talk about meiosis, what are the steps in meiosis? What are the sub steps? So you know, ITMAT plus C is mitosis. What is meiosis? Okay. Very good. Good job. That's what I want to hear. So it's ITMAT plus. And this is what I mean by weird, wacky mnemonics. The way I remember this is, does anyone have a dog? Does anyone have a little dog? You have a little dog, you need to put PMATs on your, inside your house to make sure it doesn't urinate, right? So I just remember PMAT because of that. And look, this is a thing you all have to understand. When it comes to hijacking your memory, the weirder, the more visual your story or the little relationship you have in your head, the better you'll memorize that concept. I think you can all imagine this. Can you all think back to a time you were very embarrassed in your life? Maybe you might have, you know, peed yourself in third grade or kindergarten or something. You'd remember that. But why do you remember it so vividly? Because, <laughs> partly, but you need to know the science behind it, right? You will have this structure in your brain called the amygdala, right? That's your memory center. And the amygdala is part of the memory system. Where if you can somehow trigger it and set it off, you will strengthen the memory formation process much more. Right? That is the basis of PTSD. That is the basis of visually remembering any emotional event. The more emotional event is or the crazier it is visually, the more the amygdala fires and the more you remember the concept. The reason I'm saying this is now, since I'm going to my sixth year in medicine, there is so much information in my brain because it's about to explode. The way I remember everything is I have weird stories to remember vast pieces of information. Then I store it as very tiny pieces that I logically derive the rest. Does that make sense? That's what you need to all focus on in bio as well. Okay? Good. So I like that because you went off mitosis, you said it's the same, but then we take the eye off and everything else happens. So PMAPs and then cytokinesis. Good. Now, there are a few key differences here. Can anyone tell me what stages are very, very different? So what letters are vastly different to one another? So are you going to explain what is the first stage of that? Yeah, I will. I will well, technically, you're com this is the thing. It's varied in textbooks. Some textbooks have a C at the very end. Some textbooks will have a C there. You're not wrong or right for either. It's just very, very technical detail. Technically, cytokinesis happens twice, so this would be correct. When the HC, you don't care about that, okay? There's two Cs, two cytokinesis, two splitting. Good. 
Now, did you all learn about the individual phases? Yeah. You learned about interphase specifically of meiosis or prophase specifically of meiosis? Um, that's all right. I'll take you through it. Okay. So you're going to all draw this with me because for you to draw it, that's when you'll truly understand what's going on. Okay. So get a huge page. Go to the next page. You need a full diagram for this. So I need two pages. Okay. We are going to draw meiosis as it occurs. And you need to be able to do this from scratch in your exam. They can ask you this exactly as an exam question. So this is why it's very important. So, I want you to draw a circle. In that circle, you can draw two chromosomes that are long. And I want you to pick... Does everyone have different colors? I know you might not have brought your color pencils to class, but hopefully you have different pens at least, right? So what I want you to do is draw it in different colors like this. Okay? Just so you know every single chromosome and what's going on. Okay. All right. Now, one thing, online students, I will ask you, I will always ask you your name before I ask you the question, but just make sure you mute yourself, you unmute yourself in time to answer the question, just to make sure we have the pace going well. Okay? Good. So, we'll start with Raya. Raya, what happens in interphase? What did I teach you with interphase of cell replication? Uh, DNA replicates. Very good, right? So I told you, everything doubles. Literally, the spaghetti soup doubles. But now since I've drawn it as little individual rods, you can kind of understand it, that an interphase, this one dark chromosome will get connected by a button, and what will it, what will it have next to it? Even if I wouldn't form yet, because we're not in the phase, we're in interphase. Remember I told you the X shape formally starts to form in prophase when everything condenses. But for us just to understand this, I'm not going to draw spaghetti, I'm going to draw it this way. Okay, so just know technically this only happens in prophase, but I'm drawing it this way just to get the idea across. Okay, so do you all see that one chromosome has doubled? Identical copy is attached by that centromere. We call those sister chromatids, and a lot of students struggle with this. What's a chromosome? What's a chromatid? What's chromatin? Very, very similar, right? And let me clarify it now. You see that rod, that dark rod there? That is a chromosome, okay? It is made out of chromatin. That's the material that the chromosome is made out of. What two things make up chromatin? Yara? Remember? One starts with D, it's three letters. Yeah. Good. And what was the other 60%? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah histone protein. That's, all cro that's what chromatin is made out of. Does that make sense? That's a fabric of life. Okay? Good. So, you know what chromatin is. You know what chromosome is. What's chromatid? Now, do you see when it replicated, it formed two twin sisters? Those are the sister chromatids. That's the only time you will ever need to use the word chromatid. Does that make sense to everyone? Good. So again, each, so this is a chromatid, this is a chromosome, and they're both made out of chromatin, yeah. So never get confused by those words again, okay? Chromatin is a material. So, Chromatin with an N at the end. So let me just keep clarify the words. This is chromatin is a material. Chromatid is what we describe the twin sisters as, the, the two twin chromosomes. Right? Twin pieces of chromosome. And chromosome, well, there's not much to say about chromosomes, that's what it is, right? Now, one other thing, 
when you're teach, when you're revising all of this, because one thing I do expect is you come into class every lesson remembering what you learned last lesson. That's very important. I will quiz from next lesson onwards. Before we start, the 10 minutes that we spent going through the HSC will be 10 minutes of quizzing you. Okay? And I expect you know the answers. Or if you don't, you at least ask me before class, etc. Okay? So, the way you understand all of this is you don't just write it, you don't just read it. It's the worst way to study. You need to say it out loud, teach yourself. Does that make sense? So, 30 minutes before coming to class at least, you need to go through what you learned, cover it up, and teach yourself. Okay? Now, a really good way to do it, this is what a lot of medical students do, is they use flashcard apps. Have anyone heard of Anki before? Or Quizlet? I would encourage you, you can start making certain flashcard apps, write it down on the side, go research how to use it, and start making flashcards. It's a really good way to study, especially when it's just directly recalling info, which is what bio kind of is. Okay? So that's a little tip for how to remember all of this. Good. So we've got interface, and so we're just going to draw everything else now. And I might take you to prophase, and I'll give you all a five-minute break. Okay? So I want you to redraw everything in tiny little... Like all right. So that's, that's interface. Slash the beginning of prophase. Now, we get name again. Zoe? Okay, so it was Kiara, Tanya, Zoe, Tina. I've got most of your names, I think. Okay, but again, just please tell me your names for this last one. Okay, good. So, Zoe, what happened in prophase of mitosis? Very good. Very good. Good job. We start to see spindle fibers. So, again, you can kind of redraw this X shape. What I'm just going to do, I will, I will also redraw it. Hmm. Okay. Wait, excuse me, sir. Yeah? Doesn't, doesn't, don't the um, chromosomes condense in prophase? Yes, oh. you're right. So, it actually look like spaghetti in interface, but the thing yeah. is, if I drew spaghetti in different colors for you, it wouldn't make much sense, right? Look right, right, okay. Why right. I condensed it. But like I said, technically, it should be drawn as just a bunch of different colored chromosome lines. But you're completely right. You should see the X shape only form in prophase. So, in your HC exams, the reason I bring this up is there's a lot of questions where you will need to use that logic, where you see that X shape, you know it's prophase one straight away. Okay. I'm going to test, I'm going to give you the exam question very soon. I'm going to give you, hopefully by the end of this lesson, the question from my HSC paper that a lot of students were unable to answer. You will be able to if you can follow these principles. All right. So, prophase, Zoe mentioned that the membrane starts to disappear, spindle fiber starts to form. Very good. Now, in meiosis, something else happens. Uh, maybe you learned it at school? Crossing. Crossing over. Very good. Bowen, is that right? Yeah. What else happens? As in, what is crossing over? That's what I mean to ask you. What is crossing over? Very good. So, Bowen, now I want you to speak in terms of colours. What chromosomes are going to exchange genetic material? Okay, and the next question, Varun, is which parts of the black chromosome? So I'm just going to give you numbers, right? So one represents the end part of that chromatid, two represents the end part of this, three represents four. So I'm talking about that section, so everything below that, okay? So what parts will swap? Will one and three swap? Will one and two swap? Will two and three? Two and four. I'm pretty sure it's one and three. One and three or two. So the answer here, this is how you need to understand crossing over. Crossing over is a random process. Okay? And it's a random crossing over of genetic material. And it occurs between 
the two chromosomes in a homologous pair. So it has to involve some of the black and some of the blue. Does everyone agree? What's the easiest way to get that done? If you're a lazy enzyme and you wanted to swap pieces of black and blue, which arms would you swap? Two and three. They're the closest together. Just swap them over. And how would you do it? Randomly. Completely random. Okay? That is crossing over. Does that make sense? So crossing over in an exam, before you write anything, I'll write for you. Okay, so I just want you to pay attention. Enough. Crossing over is when random regions of homologous chromosomes swap genetic material. Very important you remember this, it's random. Where it swaps, how high it swaps is random. We could randomly only swap the tip here, or we could swap this entire section here, or we could swap this entire section all the way top down. It's all random. Does that make sense? Is there anything? Completely random, right? Um, yeah. And you'll understand very soon that randomness, so I'll answer your question, but randomness is what will create variation. The reason you look different to your sibling while your parent looks different to their uncle is because of this process, plus a few other different things going on. Okay, good. Question? Um, in metaphase, it, it could happen in metaphase, but the thing with metaphase is they line up vertically, right? So they're not actually very, very close to one another, and they're spread out along the entire cell, which is like, imagine if I split all of you along the equator of the Earth. That's kind of the relative size of things you have to kind of understand. This is kind of all happening as the nucleus is only starting to break up now, so it's still in a very close proximity. Okay, good. So this is all happening in prophase one. Do you all realize there were, I'll write it again. Okay, I'll ask one of you. Lookman, what were the steps in metaphase again? What were the different phases? Um, in metaphase, you mean meiosis? Yeah, it mat, it mat plus C, P yep. mat plus C. Good, good job. So remember, this is prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one. The first time it happens, we call it one. The second time it happens, we just call it two. So it's important to clarify that, okay? So prophase one is when crossing over happens. Now, I want you all to think about this. What is the effect of crossing over? This is a hard part, usually. But I want you to think about this. Yes, but more specifically, what does it mean for gametes? What does it mean for the daughter cells? What does it mean for what alleles lie on a chromosome? What does it mean for genes? First of all, I'll ask you all this. Would the locus or would the location of genes change? No, right? Because you agree. If I'm swapping like this, you agree my nail hasn't changed places it's still at the top, right? So, exact same principle. The genes will not change that exact location. Would the variations of those genes change location? Yeah, yeah, you are. You're completely right in the sense that this nail is different than this nail. Those are variations of nails. So, when they swap, it will change location, right? So what that means, I guess we can think about in this respect. If this blue chromosome had blue eyes, the blue eye allele, this parent's chromosome had the brown eye allele, when they swap with one another, the brown eye allele will go here, the blue eye allele will go here. Now, let's draw that for one another to understand. So what you need to do now with your colored pencils is you need to make the end of this chromosome blue, you need to make the end of that chromosome black. Do the same with the, the purple and the green. Just like this. There's the final question I want you all to understand now. Is, is any sister chromatid identical anymore? Not a single one. Does everyone see that? Good. Very important to understand. So maybe we can write that underneath. And I'll define crossing over, write that underneath, and then I'll give you all your break now. Okay? So adjacent sections of homologous chromosomes.
Is this a little bit complex? Yeah? Now, I, I guess I want you all to appreciate that because this stuff is happening automatically in your body every single second on autopilot, right? Your breathing, your heart rate, all of this stuff. You are studying so hard to understand something that's happening so automatically and basically in your body, which shows you how intelligent of a design the human body is, right? Imagine if you had to, if you had to control everything. Right? It's the rate of your cell division, your heart rate, your nerve firing, your blood pressure, your enzyme activity. Pretty sure we would all die almost immediately, right? So the point here is there is a beauty to how complex this stuff is. And the other thing is when you start to understand this stuff, get to a level of knowledge where you can start applying this laterally. What I mean by this, anyone heard of CRISPR-Cas9? Does anyone know what that is? Um, it's just, even it, um, I think it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, yeah, that's the that's a history behind CRISPR. But CRISPR right now, to put it very simply, is a way for humans to start cutting and pasting genes, which is insane. Because what's going to happen very soon, right, is when someone decides to have a child, They'll get the somatazole, they'll get the ova, then they'll use CRISPR to cut and paste the genes they want in those gametes. Then you can start pasting it and form a new organism that has the genes you want it to have. In fact, it's already been used, I think it was used to cure, it was either HIV or another permanent disease that we've never cured before in babies. It was done in China legally. I think the, the doctor who did that I think is on the run or maybe in jail now, right? <laughs> but the reason being, that the point I'm trying to get across here is we're at the very beginning of a biotech revolution, right? This is the first time ever in human existence we've been able to cut and paste our genes, change the very fabric of who we are. And the way we discovered that is because some scientists were just discovering or learning how bacteria fight bugs. If she came across this and she applied it to the human genome, that's CRISPR. The point being, with things like bio, you may not see the direct implication of what you're learning, but there'll be a lot of implications if you can think laterally using that info. Okay. Good. On that note, I'm going to give you all a five minute break. Stand up, stretch, you know, you can you get some water if you'd like, you use the restroom. We will recap at 12 30. Okay? Good. The same for you on for online students as well. So take a five minute break. Okay, uh, we'll jump back into it. Okay, um, all right, everyone. This section is the more challenging part of my essay, so I need you to put 110% effort now. What kind of why I gave you the break before then, okay? It's a lot of critical thinking now. All right, so the circle we've gone through interphase, prophase, and you can see this is a, this is a good diagram of the process. And can you see how the chromosome ends actually crossing over? Hence the term crossing over. Right? There's another name for crossing over. Does anyone know what we also call this process? You might see it in a textbook somewhere. It's also known as synapsis. You can, it's still different ways, but typically this way, right? But uh, you can call it crossing over. Just so you know, if you see this in a question, that is what the process is referring to. Now, we're going to metaphase. Now, with metaphase, what happened in mitosis? This is what you always need to do. You need to think about what happened in my mitosis, compare that with meiosis, because that is how you're going to understand meiosis. So I'll ask Lukman, what process occurs in mitosis in metaphase one? Um, Sister chromatids line up along the equator of the cell. Very good, along the equator. And we kind of see that process occurring here. 
But do you see how they're not lined up linearly on the equator? They line up in pairs. Because something different happens here. As they line up in pairs, the spindle fibers will attach as such. Does everyone see that? Now, there is a very big difference with this order of attachment. Look at your mitosis diagram if you've drawn one, and uh, look at this. Does anyone notice any differences? So in mitosis, how many spindle fibers attach to the centromere? Yeah, did you all notice? When we spoke about mitosis, the way it worked is there was the replicated chromosome, a spindle fiber attached here, a spindle fiber attached here. So when they pulled, what happened? The two sets of chromatids ripped to opposite end of the cell. But now, when these spindle fibers pull, what's going to happen? Are the sister chromosomes going to rip apart? No. Entire chromosomes move to opposite ends of the cell. I want you to write that in red. That is the most important difference, right? So this is not in metaphase yet. Because remember, in metaphase, we don't pull. The second you start pulling, what do we call that phase? So I'm talking about anaphase here. Okay, so does everyone see that? Have a look at this. Entire chromosomes are getting pulled to opposite ends of the cell. So I want you to write in anaphase one, Entire chromosomes translocate to opposite ends of the cell. Okay, very good. Now, I have a question for all of you. Looking at these two chromosomes, what's their relationship? What do we call them? Are they sister chromatids? Are they homologous pairs? They're homologous pairs. Now, what do you all notice? When this homologous pair moves in this direction, where did the other homologous pair go? Opposite direction. Now, the question I have for you, is if this blue chromosome was on the left, which direction would the blue chromosome move? To the left, right? The point being, the position of those two chromosomes is completely random, right? So what I mean by that is, I want you to focus solely on one homologous pair for me. Focus on this homologous pair. We'll call this chromosome one, we'll call this chromosome two, the entire replicated chromosome. What I'm saying is a chromosome that ends up on the left is completely random. Has a 50% chance of being one, has a 50% chance of being chromosome two. Random, remember that. But when they get pulled, what do you notice? Those two chromosomes, chromosome one and chromosome two, must go to opposite end of the cell. They segregate. Does everyone agree? We have a name for this process. Random segregation. Now, what did you all realize? Did I even look at those tiny little molecular chromosomes when I was explaining this to you? No. This is solely to do with in one molecular pair. Does that make sense? So random segregation, first thing I want you to understand, is it's some process that occurs within a molecular pair. If you ever get asked a question about random segregation, forget about everything else, zoom in on one molecular step. The chromosomes must move to opposite end of the cell. Completely random, though. Let's think about what the effect of that is, right? There's a reason I'm stressing this to you, because they love to ask this question, right? So what? That is a question. What is the effect of random segregation? Now, the way for you to understand this is to understand that eventually, how many daughter cells are we going to form in meiosis? Four. It was two in mitosis. We're going to form four in meiosis. Now, what's going to happen, everyone, is that, as I just said, the movement of these two chromosomes is random, but they go to opposite ends. And once they go to opposite ends, let's just look at this chromosome here. Right? I'm going to draw it like this. I'll draw it, uh, we'll do it white. 
That's what it looks like, right? The dark section is the blue, the rest is the red, right? So it's moved to the left map. Now remember, it happens if maps C, T map C. That's my axis. So we're currently at anaphase phase one. It's going to eventually be a anaphase. phase. I think this is the exact same as mitosis. In fact, you, you remember the entire PMAT section? That is the exact same as mitosis. The exact same to the T. So, what happened in anaphase of mitosis? What happened to those two chromatids? They got ripped apart. Remember, there's two centimeters attaching to them. They got ripped apart. So, what's going to happen to this chromosome in anaphase 2? The exact same. It's going to rip apart. So, have a look at this. This end will go here. This end will go into that gamete. What do you notice? Do those two gametes generate the exact same genetic info? Or is it different? That is partly how crossing over creates genetic variability, right? That's one point. But what I'm trying to stress here, I'm trying to guide you to what the implication of random segregation is. Can you word it for me? What is the effect of random segregation on the gametes? That is my question to you. Think about it. I don't want you to just blurt out an answer. What is the effect of random segregation on these gametes? So I want you to use the words alleles to get your answer. Maybe the alleles, yes, we're getting there. I want someone to articulate it a little bit more. Very good, good. So imagine this is going to be you. This gamete is eventually going to connect with another one to form you, right? This is your parent set. This is um, one of your parent sets, right? Now, yeah, I'm going to pick some random alloy. Let's pick uh, Icar just to keep it simple. Okay, so let's imagine this chromosome or this chromatid from here had uh, brown eyes, capital B for brown. And let's say this entire chromosome had little b, which is blue eyes. Everyone with me? Okay, what would this orange represent? So let's imagine that the, the eye color aloe was in that section which is being swapped over, right? So what I'm trying to say is this N represents capital B. So this N since it's blue must represent small b because it's the exact same as this N, okay? And this N must be capital B. Okay, cool. Everyone's got that point. Now, we said that this chromosome moves randomly to one end, right? So what does that mean for this gamete? It randomly can inherit these alleles, or it randomly can inherit these alleles, right? And when this chromosome splits, it randomly will inherit one of capital B over the root. So the effect of random segregation is gametes randomly inherit alleles. That is the effect, okay? Now, if this didn't directly make sense just yet, that is fine. This is a very hard concept. When you, you go through this multiple times, by the end of Mod 5, you will understand it. Because we'll come back and touch this multiple times. But for now, the key principle is, since the chromosomes randomly moved into gametes, and since the chromosomes carry alleles, gametes randomly inherit alleles. That's the overall crux here. Does that generally make sense to everyone? Chromosomes randomly inherit, so these gametes will randomly inherit alleles. That's the key principle that I'll write down for us here. Gametes randomly inherit alleles for a gene. And let's define random segregation first. So who wants to give it a go at defining the word random segregation? Anyone? Well, don't complicate it. So, first thing you can do is you can mention it's a process that occurs within a homologous pair of chromosomes, right? The way I would define it is pay attention to my definition first. Before you write it, I'll write it for you. Okay? 
So in random segregation, chromosomes within a homologous pair randomly move to opposite ends of the cell. Full stop. Occurs in that phase one. Right? You see how I didn't talk about independent to other chromosomes? We'll come to that. I know what you're talking about. It's a different, slightly different process. But key point I want you to understand is random segregation is within a homologous pair. And it's when chromosomes within a homologous pair move to opposite end of the cell. Okay, so again, this is one homologous pair. Chromosomes within it will randomly move to opposite end of the cell. Makes sense. Okay, good. And the implication of it that I want you to understand is that gametes randomly inherit allos for a gene. So the end to the opposite end of the cell before anaphase? In anaphase, so this is all in anaphase. So random segregation is a process that only occurs in anaphase one. Very good question. Now, when I first learned this, I had a ton of questions and I was confused at first. So it's completely fine. This is where you just digest the process. If you have any questions at all, feel free to ask me now. You can always ask me later as well. Does anyone have any pertinent questions right now? No. Um, so, like, after, like, the crossing over is done, do we add eye color? Do they only, like, um, yeah, like, uh, dominant, the dominant eye color, or, like... So, the, do you mean the gametes? Yeah. It's completely rare. So, again, imagine, let's imagine we're looking at the top section here. Let's figure out the bottom section, right? Let's say we're talking about hair color. Let's make it very simple. It's going to be weird, but uh, this is blue hair. And this is, let's say, orange hair, just the color of the chromosomes, right? Now, let's say, Alicia, you're going to be one of the gametes on the left. This is one chromosome, this is another chromosome. Which direction should this chromosome go? Pick a random direction. So it's random segregation. Left. Because of that random process, Alicia, you will now have orange hair, right? Whereas the gametes on this end will only have blue hair in that case, right? So did you see how random that process was? If by chance the blue chromosome had lined up on the left, Alicia or the gamete that would form Alicia would have gotten the blue hair, right? So that's the implication of random segregation, okay? That gametes will randomly inherit allos for a gene. Do you all agree? We're talking about hair color here, right? But just because the orange chromosome of the homologous pen moved to the left, Alicia now has to get orange hair, right? If it was the other way, she would have got the other hair color. Okay? So that is what random situation is. Okay, so it's completely random. If you get the dominant L, you could get the recessive L. What about like people that have like two different hair colors? So we'll talk about that very soon. But the reason is, right now we're simplifying things, right? There are a lot of traits that are what we call polygenic. What that means is there is more than one gene going to that trait. There is a gene on chromosome 7, a gene on chromosome 6, a gene on chromosome 5, 4, etc. Right? And they all interact to make a unique color in themselves. They can be rare interactions, but can be very unique high color. It's very similar for height. You'll see, if there was only one gene coding for height, does everyone agree? Everyone would either be tall or short. That's what happens when you have a trait that is controlled for by one gene. There's only two variations of it, a dominant and a recessive. But you see, height is like a, it's like a bell curve. A lot of people are middle, some people are very short, some people are very... That tells you there's way more genes than just one controlled of height. And that's real life. But for you to apply it, we're keeping very simple for that. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. Right. So does anyone have any questions about random segregation? So process that occurs in uh, phase one. Yes, look me. Yeah. Um so doesn't isn't random segregation like doesn't that directly correlate to uh, uh independent assortment? 
Yes, it does. It does correlate it to it, and that's why I'm going to talk about them very right. soon. Right, okay. okay. Yes. If the stable part is the stable part is so the spindles, right? Remember what happens in G, what happens in G one of mitosis, meiosis, and interface? Organelles replicate. Does anyone know what organelle makes spindle fibers? Centriole, very good. Centromere is a button. Centriole, just an organelle that makes spindle fibers. You can all Google search it. It just looks like a cylinder with a bunch of little lines inside of it that will come out of tentacles, right? Now, the reason I bring that up is your cell normally has one centriole, but in G1, it forms another that will migrate to the opposite end of the cell. And then when they produce spindle fibers, it'll produce it like this. Now do you see it has to get pulled to opposite ends? But, mm. since the random right, no, so the right, so what it, the random part is what chromosome ends up on the right. That chromosome has to get pulled to the right. Does that make sense? It's not random that the spindle will pull it to the other direction, it has to pull it to the direction it came from. Spindles will always pull wherever they came from, they'll contract and pull that way. The random part is between one and two, one or two could have ended up in the right. It's random which one did segregate to that direction. Okay, and then it gets segregated, pulled to that. Okay, any other questions at all? Yeah? So mutation is very complex. In fact, there's a whole module six, which is solely to do with mutations. For now, I want you to solely focus on what's not. Because if we start talking about mutations, you'll get very confused. Okay, we'll come to that. Maybe I'll go through some very high level mutation points. Now, forget about that part. We'll come to that very shortly. Okay, good. Now, in the last five minutes or so, since we started a little bit late, is everyone happy to go to about maybe 102, 103? Okay, right? Just in case your parents are waiting, if they're urgently waiting, you maybe message them now to say we've gone a little bit later than normal. But, um, I'm just going to highlight this very important point to us. Now, we've spoken about random segregation. We're going to talk about independent assortment now. That is, a, number one, a completely different process. Okay? They're not the same. Independent assortment, random segregation are two different processes. But they happen at the exact same time. Okay? So, when did random segregation happen? So, when must independent assortment happen? Right? And I think one is the most important step of meiosis. Everything else is easy. You guys are, right now you're touching upon one of the hardest concepts in your top bio. So if you find it challenging, that's completely fine. Students who are better set the head to see don't understand this stuff. Okay? So you'll, you'll be fine. Now, when we talk about independent assortment, this is when you have to start looking at different homologous pairs. Do you see how we only focused on one homologous pair? We said random segregation, we said in a homologous pair. Chromosomes are randomly moved to opposite directions. They have to go to opposite directions. So, is the movement of chromosome 1 and 2 dependent on one another? Think about this. If chromosome 1 goes to the left, where must chromosome 2 go? It has to go to the right. These are random processes in that one could have positioned itself in the right or to the left. That, that was random. But when it starts moving to the left, other chromosome must go opposite direction. What about these two chromosomes? If Let's have a look at these two chromosomes. Right? This chromosome, since its position on the left, has to go to the left. This chromosome, since its position in the right, the spindle fiber will attach to it and pull it to the right. But was the movement of these two little chromosomes dependent on these two big chromosomes at all? It's completely random. They assorted themselves randomly as well. Does everyone realize that? So, what could have very equally happened is that this chromosome here, let me start rubbing out all these lines, this chromosome here could have positioned itself on the left. If it did that, where would it go? To the left. That's random. And it did not depend on these two big chromosomes. Does everyone agree? So, what independent assortment is saying? 
is it saying that the random segregation of this homologous pair and a different homologous pair are completely independent to one another, right? So whether this one goes to the left and this one goes to the right does not affect another homologous pair. And the same thing for another one. Imagine we've got a, a whole other homologous pair here. This is your third homologous pair, or do it in dark like this, right? This one, because it positioned itself on the right, has to go. This one has to go. But did it depend on the movement of these two big chromosomes at all? No. That's all independent assortment is saying. It's saying that the random segregation of different homologous pairs is independent to one another. Do you see how random segregation is within a homologous pair? We have to zoom in on one and two and say if one goes to the left, two must go to the right. But we're saying independent assortment, we need to zoom out now. We need to look at two different homologous pairs and say they segregate independent of one another. That is what independent assortment is. Okay, I guess we have to use this as a little thought experiment. If you two were one homologous pair, you two were another homologous pair, Georgina, pick a direction you want to go. Self random, right? You have to go. Pick a random direction you want to go. Right, where do you have to go? Did your decision depend on hers? Right, that's independent assortment. Random segregation is within a homologous pair, they have to go to opposite directions. Independent assortment is two different homologous pairs. They're independent to one another. Okay? Does that generally make sense so far? Don't worry, we're going to come back to it. We're going to see diagram in the next lesson. I'm going to throw you an exam questions, and then you will truly understand it. Right now, you only get the basics. We're going to take you through exam questions next lesson. We'll, we'll understand this. Okay? Now, this lesson had to be very theory focused because I can't give you exam questions until you truly understand this. And this is one of the hardest concepts in bio. Okay? But next lesson, and usually, I'll give you a ton of exam questions to practice. Okay, so this is a rare one-off complete theory lesson. Good. Does anyone have any questions thus far? Ask away. This last minute or two is completely question time. You can ask anything you would like. So, the same. They happen at the same time, right? Independent assortment is talking about random segregation, but just with different homologous pairs, right? So they, they both correlate, as Lukman mentioned. They both happen together, but you're talking about slightly different things. That is why I don't want you to mix it up. They're not the same thing. Okay? Yes? Does this happen in anaphase 2? No, not in anaphase 2. Only anaphase 1. So the random segregation of the assortment across an overlay will happen in the first person? Only in the first step. That is why I haven't even taught you metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2, because it's the exact same as mitosis. I'll very briefly spend five minutes going through a next lesson. Very easy. Just, this is probably the most complex time. Okay? Any uh, questions? Yeah? Yeah, I had a question. So, does um, independent assortment happen at metaphase? No. Independent assortment, random segregation are both anaphase 1. Okay, both out of phase one. Okay. But, um, right, so, no, but isn't in metaphase because that's when they actually line up. So, wouldn't that be the time when they independently line up? Or assault, yeah, sorry? When they independently line up. But when we talk about random segregation, that process begins when the chromosomes start to segregate from one another. And that only happens in anaphase. Does that make sense? Now, a lot of textbooks have this. A lot of textbooks will say, Metaphase one for uh, I think random segregation, but the correct answer is adaphase. You will never be marked down for that, especially in the agency. Okay, good. Does that make um, sense? Yeah, 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 but I'm talking about um, independent assortment. Would that be in metaphase one? So remember, independent assortment says the random segregation of one homologous pair is different to another homologous pair. It's still talking about random segregation, and that only happens in anaphase one. Hence, independent assortment also happens at the same time. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, good. Good. Any other questions from any of us? All right, good job. We went through literally, I'd say, one of the top four hardest concepts in HD bio. So, congratulations. I know it was hard. Next lesson, we'll go through a ton of questions you'll understand. Okay, good. On that note, 
I'll leave you all to it. Have a good week, and I will see you all in person next week. And anyone who has assessments, feel free to stay back. And I'm happy to quickly go through your assessment for a couple minutes if you need. Okay? All right, everyone. I will see you all next week. Take care.